Entering our third month of the MLB lockout, we're basically where we started. The league and the players have been meeting uh, here and there only recently to discuss serious issues. And the latest is that they met yesterday in a heated 90-minute meeting. So we'll give you uh, the latest on what went down in that meeting and what's to come next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide episodes three days a week for now, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube as well, so please check us out there if you have not already. And yeah, as I said, coming up on today's show, we're going to give you the latest on the MLB lockout. We're about two weeks away from when spring training was supposed to open, and that's very much in jeopardy. The reality is, I've been saying all along, I expect spring training to be delayed, and I expect the regular season, unfortunately, to be delayed. It's going to take those pressures on both sides from the prospect of missed games uh, in order to really make them move and reach an agreement because right now they're very far apart. So the latest is that they had this, quote, heated 90-minute meeting on Tuesday at the league office in New York. And so the latest is coming from The Athletic, courtesy of Evan Drellich, who has been key in covering the lockout uh, and really labor negotiations between these two sides for the last couple of years. And so in this latest proposal on Tuesday, the union changed its uh, pre-arbitration bonus pool proposal from $105 million to $100 million. So a small change. And the latest before yesterday was that the league had accepted the idea of a bonus pool, which is actually a really big deal. But the league is offering $10 million versus the players had been offering uh, $105 million to be in this bonus pool, but they've come down to $100 million. So 10 times the money apart, the league at 10, the players at 100, but there's more because the players are basically proposing that this bonus pool go to players who are pre-arbitration eligible based on performance. So the top performers get the most of this bonus pool. But the key factor here is that the players are also proposing that players reach arbitration after two years of service time, whereas the current system is that players reach arbitration after three years of service time, with the exception being that players in the top 22% in terms of service between two and three years get to arbitration uh, earlier after two plus years instead of having to reach three. So as far apart as they sound, they're even further apart than the 10 million versus 100 million would indicate. So that was one of the two main topics presented on Tuesday by the players. And the second is, re is in regards to service time manipulation. The union has proposed a system where a player who might not normally get a year of service time would be credited with one year if they reach certain thresholds and levels of performance. The union plan would award a full year of service to rookies who finish in the top five in their league for rookie of the year, top three for reliever of the year, and or make first or second team all MLB. Before Tuesday's adjustments, and I'm quoting here from The Athletic, non-outfielders and non-pitchers who place top 10 at their positions in their respective leagues according to an average of baseball reference, wins above replacement, and fan graphs wins above replacement would also 
or also would qualify, as would starting pitchers, relief pitchers, and outfielders who place top 30. Now it's top 7 and top 20, respectively. So the point is, they're keeping with this idea, which we've talked about the problems with using wins above replacement as a means for rewarding uh, players with a year of service time. It's extremely problematic because wins above replacement as great of a concept as I think that it is. And every team uses some form of this, probably their own proprietary uh, metric here using, because that's the thing is that wins above replacement. You can't go to a baseball game, watch a player on the field and tell me, well, this was his war for today. It is something you have to kind of make up, right? Whereas you can tell me how many hits did they have in how many plate appearances? How many times did they strike out? Those things are kind of indisputable, but wins above replacement is made up by different websites. And so it's problematic because they're constantly making tweaks. Different sources use different calculations. That's why they're talking about averaging baseball reference and fan graphs. And while I think averaging the two is a good idea, it's still problematic and, and those sources don't want this. So anyway, it is troubling to me that both sides, the league and the players, are kind of going down this road with this idea. It's just that they differ in terms of how they want to use it, but they're both talking about using it. So anyway, that was what came out of this meeting on Tuesday. The union also incorporated and modified an element of MLB's proposal on service time manipulation, dangling a draft pick to teams as an incentive for not holding a player in the minor leagues. And so, yeah, apparently it was heated. We didn't really get any more details about what exactly uh, was heated about this meeting, but that's that's the word that we're hearing. So coming up in a minute, we're just going to run through several of the issues that the two sides remain far apart on and why, uh, you know, the idea that there's any kind of serious momentum towards a deal is just false because they're so far apart. So we will get into that in just a minute. But first, it's the new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky, waxy, or taste like a chemical spill. Uh, you want to eat healthy, it just gets so boring right about now. I mean, certainly by February 2nd, you're probably thinking, this just isn't worth it, where's the chocolate? Maybe you're well past that point. Built Bars are covered in 100% chocolate, and most contain just 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, to go along with 17 grams of protein. You really have to check it out, and they're delicious. Go to BillBar.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at BillBar.com. Okay, as promised, we are going to continue to talk about where the two sides stand uh, in these labor negotiations, trying to work out a new collective bargaining agreement so that we can have baseball in 2022. Right now, unfortunately, despite the fact that it's undeniable that progress has been made in the sense that they're actually meeting with one another because for the first, you know, all of December and most of January, they weren't even meeting to discuss serious issues. So that was annoying, but a fact. And so now they're actually meeting to discuss serious issues. But the fact is, they're very far apart. And Ken Rosenthal and Evan, Evan Drellich in The Athletic came out with an article a couple days ago basically throwing cold water on the notion that there's any kind of serious momentum towards a deal here because the two sides actually remain so far apart even though they've been meeting. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. So I thought this was a, a really nice article in The Athletic. Rosenthal and Drellich just go through point by point and talk about where things stand. And so the first thing they talk about is the minimum salary. This has been a point of, point of contention between these two sides in these negotiations. The players have proposed increasing the minimum 
from 570.5 thousand to 775 thousand, a substantial increase, but still a reasonable one, I would say. The owners have proposed that the players will earn 615 thousand in the in their first year of service, 650k in their second, and 700k in their third. The increase of 44,500 for first-year players will be the largest they have ever received, and 27.5 thousand more than the amount the union negotiated for them in the 2016 collective bargaining agreement. But the union notes the boost is barely above a cost-of-living increase. A significant point, inflation uh, has been through the roof, and the league is proposing something that barely keeps up with inflation. But the the kind of key point here is that teams are not allowed to exceed these amounts, whereas in the current system now, teams are allowed to reward players if they so desire, uh, because players are only eligible to receive the minimum for their first X number of years until they reach arbitration, whether it's two or two plus uh, for the super two exceptions. But under the league's current proposal, they're talking about eliminating teams' ability to pay players more than this. And so the union is coming away from these talks basically feeling like the league, anytime they give anything, they take two things with it. And that's exactly how it seems to me. Uh, the, the, the league just does not want to give up anything at all. And on the one hand, it's really frustrating. On the other hand, that's what uh, Commissioner Rob Manfred was really hired for was, I mean, he's a lawyer by trade and they are trying to get the best deal possible for the owners. But it just uh, it doesn't really sit well with me how they're negotiating. But that's that's where we are. The league is proposing a possible increase, but then they're putting caps on those increases. So the next issue is arbitration and, and the pre-arbitration bonus pool. And yeah, I mean, the key thing is arbitration eligibility with the players wanting players to reach arbitration after two years. The league has said that they're just flat out not going to touch this issue. It is non-negotiable. Well, guess what? Everything is negotiable. I would be very surprised if the players end up accomplishing getting players to arbitration after two years. I think that a larger bonus pool amount is eventually something that they'll get if they get anything in this area. And the, you know, but the players by asking for two things here, them reaching arbitration sooner and having this large bonus pool, to me, they can't have it both. And and they'll have to just pick one or the other. And I think that the one that the league is probably ultimately more willing to give on is a larger bonus pool, simply because the league in its proposals has accepted the idea of this bonus pool. But, you know, if the players also want the two years arbitration eligibility, then if they give that up, I think the play, the league will eventually uh, cave a little bit and maybe the bonus pool ends up at 50 million, maybe it's 75 million. But uh, what the league is offering now, 10 million, I just think is kind of laughable because... I mean, to split that up among all players with with less than three years of service, I guess excluding that Super 2 group, it's just kind of a laughably small amount of money to divvy up amongst that many players. So the next issue is the luxury tax. And this is one, I think it's uh, interesting that in this article, Rosenthal and Drellich point out that it's telling that the league calls the luxury tax the competitive balance tax. And it is telling because the league contends that this tax is in place to keep competitive integrity intact and make it so, you know, bigger market teams can't just spend their way to titles and championships. But in reality, I think it's really great the way that they uh, write this out in the article, in reality, we've had a ton of parity in the sport. We've had a ton of different uh, champions in our game, and 
compared to basketball and football, where they, they talk about how Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Ben Roethlisberger, and Patrick Mahomes had led the AFC entrant in 18 of the past 20 Super Bowls. What is that? Four different quarterbacks, 18 of 20 Super Bowls in the AFC. And in the NBA, where there's a salary cap, the Lakers, Warriors, Cavs, Heat, and Spurs have won 18 of the past 23 titles. Whereas in baseball, 15 different teams have won the World Series in the past 21 years. And yeah, I mean, just all kinds of great examples in this story. And so in reality, I'm not so sure that you need a kind of low number, 210 million as it currently stands, where you're just taxing teams who go above that in order to help these lower revenue teams. Uh, Because even like lower revenue teams, think about the A's, and the Rays, they have payrolls in the, you know, closer to 50 million than 100 million oftentimes, and yet they're extremely competitive. And so in reality, the luxury tax has functioned more like a cap as opposed to some kind of tool to keep competitive balance in place. And so they're very far apart. The league is proposing a modest increase of like $4 million dollars off of where it is now at 210 million, whereas the players are proposing raising it to 245 million uh, immediately and then 273 million by the end of this agreement. And so they are very far apart here. And this is ultimately something that I think is going to be a big sticking point because it is understandable. Uh, that the players are going to fight hard for this because it really has functioned like a cap and it's kept payrolls mostly below this number. And there's really no reason. uh, I think the whole introduction of this idea was bad for the sport. And uh, it's something the players are going to fight hard for, in my opinion. So coming up next, we will talk about the draft lottery and service time manipulation. And that's that's about it. Those are the other two issues discussed in this article, but you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, but first, Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through the playoffs and beyond, right to the big game in a couple weeks. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports, scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football. Bet Online has up to the minute info on pro and college hoops. NHL, boxing, UFC, right along with live real-time updates of current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. Bet online where the game starts. All right, here we go. We are going to get to these last couple of issues discussed in this piece in The Athletic by Ken Rosenthal and Evan Drellich, talking about the, the, the issues in which the players and the league remain very far apart on which. Uh, And, and there are four main ones, right? That uh, they, they lay out here and it's good that we're kind of zeroing in on several key issues that uh, are going to be the fight of these negotiations. But what's bad is that there's really no momentum towards reaching an agreement. It is interesting that in some ways, they agree in principle on on concepts that are different. And another example of that is this draft lottery. We currently don't have anything like that in baseball. They do have it in other sports. So what they write here in The Athletic is, quote, the league, by acquiescing to a lottery, is acknowledging for the first time that tanking is a problem. The question is, what will fix it? Both sides would include all non-playoff teams in a lottery, The league wants only the top three picks in play. The union wants the top eight. And while that number probably is negotiable, the bigger fight might be over the union's desire to reward additional picks to teams that reach certain levels of performance. The league wants no part of such plan. So this to me is a really interesting one because why would the league not want to reward teams that reach the playoffs. I think it makes too much sense 
we really must do something to fully incentivize competition. And if the league is serious about wanting competition and, and making the claim that tanking isn't really a big issue, then why not uh, do whatever they can to encourage teams to be competitive? I think whatever they can do in this area is going to be essential. And I like the idea of the draft lottery, and both sides are willing to talk about it. The league proposing that the top three picks be in play. So uh, all non... I don't I don't actually fully even understand the draft lottery. I have to kind of do my homework here. I don't follow the other sports that have a lottery as closely, nearly as closely as baseball. But my kind of rough understanding from reading through this stuff is that all non-playoff teams would be in, entered into a lottery, uh, the league saying for the top three picks, with the teams that finished at the bottom having a higher chance of getting the first overall pick say but not being guaranteed the first overall pick because right now there does seem to be a race to the bottom among some teams right now the Baltimore Orioles very much so the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, another example of that and so the the league wants the top eight picks being in play here and I think that that's better I side with the players pretty much on all of these issues so but the the other, I mean, like they're they're writing here, it's not just about three picks versus eight picks. It's about uh, rewarding playoff teams and the league not wanting uh, any part of that. So they continue here. Under the union proposal, smaller market teams that make the postseason would receive a draft pick right before competitive balance round A. Smaller market teams that finish with at least a 500 record would receive a draft pick right before competitive balance round B. The union, in an effort to further incentivize competition, also would remove from the lottery small market teams that finish in the bottom four the previous two seasons and large market teams that finish in the bottom eight. I don't see a problem with any of this because at heart, clearly the goal is to incentivize competition. And why is that possibly a bad thing? So they continue, the league previously has awarded picks On the basis of market size, the competitive balance rounds exist to benefit the 10 lowest revenue clubs and the 10 from the smallest markets. When it comes to the lottery, the league is not interested in awarding additional picks to such clubs. Prohibiting a team from participating three years in a row would would provide a further deterrent to tanking in the league's view. Still, if the goal is to incentivize competition, why not do more, they write. Under the league's plan, the team with the worst record in the sport would be guaranteed no worse than the fourth pick in the next year's draft, and small market teams that compete successfully would go with no reward. How does that make any sense? How can the league possibly justify that? So they need to be called out on this. This is arguably, to me, an area where their warts are showing the most. Like They just seem to be trying to protect teams that don't really feel like being competitive. And I don't see that as possibly justifiable here. Uh, Perhaps I need to do more uh, reading on this issue, but to me, I completely side with the players on this one. So in terms of service time manipulation, we already talked about that. The union would award a full year of service to rookies who finish in the top five in rookie of the year, reliever of the year. We already talked about all of this. MLB, on the other hand, says the union proposal would reward far too broad a group of players and also contains other flaws. The league's plan is to motivate teams to promote top prospects through another method, the awarding of a draft pick. The incentive would only would apply to a player who enters the season as a top 100 prospect. According to a mutually agreed upon definition, then achieves a full year of service and is a top three finisher in Rookie of the Year or top five finisher finisher in Cy Young or MVP voting in any of his first three seasons. That's far too narrow, I would say, of a group of players. Not many enter as a top 100 prospect. And so the idea, again, I, I just don't like that at all. I think that the player's proposal makes a lot more sense. Just simply, if they're, if these rookies come out and basically are rookie of the year contenders, they should be given a year of service even if they didn't play a full season. And that makes a lot of sense to me. 
and the league's idea is too narrow. It's possible that the player's idea is too broad, but how about we find some middle ground here? And I think eventually they will, but that's just another example of how far apart these two sides are. They are far apart on all of these issues, and so we're not anywhere near a resolution to these negotiations, but they're going to continue, and we're going to be there to cover it all along the way. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. Also liking, commenting, subscribing on YouTube, all of that good stuff. So thank you in advance and thank you to everyone who's done so already. Coming up uh, later in the week, either Thursday or Friday, we're going to get back into the mailbag. We're also going to have a crossover with Miller Thomas from Locked on D-backs coming for you at some point in the near future. Anyway, I can't wait to be with you again later in the week. I hope you found this episode informative. Make sure you hit that like button if you did and comment below. Can't wait to be with you again uh, later in the week, like I said. So until then, see you next time.